This is John with WesleyGospel.com. Um, today I'm going to ask the question and answer the question, do modern day prophets exist today in the church? Do modern day prophets exist today? My answer is yes. I do believe that modern day prophets exist today. And um, uh, so to approach this from a Wesleyan uh, point of view, any theological subject has to be approached through the Wesleyan quadrilateral. It goes like this. Scripture comes first because it's the primary authority for theology in the Christian life. The second thing is church history, which basically means church fathers, Puritans, historical theologians that speak with authority. The second, the third thing is reason. You know, you use your reasoning, you use your head, you think it through. Does this thing make sense? And then the last thing is personal experience, personal spiritual experience. So I'm going to try to approach that through uh, the prism of that that quadrilateral. First off, if we're if we're asking the question, do Christian prophets exist today? Today, in the year 2024, is there biblical grounds to believe that there are Christian prophets alive today? Um, yes. Um, I would. I'm gonna um, just go from the hip here. Uh, but um, we're going to start off by a, a phrase that uh, Jesus himself uh, said. Yeah, I, I only became aware of this, uh, this verse a, a couple of years ago. I believed in modern day prophets for 20 years or more about that. But I only recently became aware of Matthew 23:34. And uh, this is an interesting scripture. Um, so Matthew 23 is this scripture where Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees for all their hypocritical character traits, right? But in this passage, he actually establishes uh, a foundational doctrine, and that is that in the church age, there are prophets, in the church age, Matthew 23, out of the mouth of Jesus himself, right? Uh, and, and this is just a really interesting scripture to me. He says in Matthew 23, 34, he says, I am sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. I, in the first, he doesn't say, I'm sending you preachers. He doesn't say, I'm sending you evangelists. He doesn't say, I'm sending you pastors. The first thing he says, the first thing he says is, I am sending you prophets. Matthew 23, 34. And that's astounding if you really, really sit there and think about that for a while. I am sending you prophets. Jesus said that to the Pharisees, and, and then furthermore, he said that they will be persecuted and even martyred. I am sending you prophets. Jesus Christ said that. Matthew 23, 34. What is a prophet? What is a prophet? Let's go to Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12, please. Once you get there, A really clear definition of what a prophet is here in Numbers chapter 12, uh, verse 6. Before I read that and talk about that, um, the context is Moses took to himself another wife, I believe, because Sephira, his first wife, had abandoned him. And so he took this other wife, and but she was black. She had black skin, um, black as could be. And um, I think that um, 
Miriam and Aaron had some racial problems with that against interracial marriage. And uh, and so they they spoke against it. And God himself came down in a theophany in an open vision apparition and was manifested in human form and all all three of them saw it. And he rebuked Miriam because apparently Miriam was the main person speaking against it. He rebuked Miriam for not respecting Moses as prophet of God and for speaking against his choice of a wife. And Miriam's skin became leprosy. Why was her skin become leprosy? Because I think this was a skin-based racial issue that Miriam had towards this black woman. And God was saying, how dare you? How dare you come here to the God's leading prophet, say that you're a prophet to and furthermore criticize his black wife and he makes her full of leprosy her skin right and uh and in the context of this in this context uh god gives a very clear definition of what a prophet is word for word from the mouth of God himself. He said this in, in, in Numbers 12, uh, 6, listen to my words. When a prophet of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. There's your definition. Numbers 12, 6, a prophet is a person that sees either the Father or Jesus or the Holy Spirit in some way, shape, or form, most likely in a veiled form in dreams and visions. That's it. Those are the experiences undergirding the message of a prophet. And back to Matthew 23, 34, Jesus says, I am sending you prophets. Okay, this is Jesus' understanding of what a prophet is. Now, if you're unless you're looking for the word dream in the word vision, you're gonna pass by it. You're gonna pass by it. But you know, the first two chapters, need I remind you, Matthew chapter one and Matthew chapter two, it's it's one dream after another. Joseph is basically a story of Joseph getting directional prophecy through dreams. Matthew chapter 1 Matthew chapter 2. That's all it's uh, Joseph is is bouncing around all over the place because he's obeying angels through dreams. That's what's going on in Matthew chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 2. Uh and uh so Jesus understands that and I personally believe Ira Milligan's book, Understanding the Dreams You Dream, helped me to draw this conclusion. I personally believe that the parables of Jesus are either complete uh, recitations, that's Jesus reciting dreams that he had, or influenced by the idea of prophetic dreams. They're either actual dreams or influenced by the idea of prophetic dreams because the parables are just like dreams they really are uh you know and, and jesus and there was a prophecy in the old testament that said that jesus would open his mouth in parables things that were secret from the foundation of the world well what does that sound like if not dream interpretation right and so there were even times when the apostles were like can you please explain this parable to us can you please explain this parable to us they might as well have said can you please interpret this dream for us and that sort of thing had been done had been done by daniel had been done by joseph uh, in the book of genesis 
So uh, I personally believe, and I have it's on my bucket list, uh, Abraham Heschel's The Prophets. It's a really deep study of, of the Old Testament prophets. Um, I have never studied it. I, it's on my bucket list. But I believe there's this theory floating out there in the Bible scholar community that the writings of the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, etc., that that poetic prophecy that you see, these poems, these prophetic poems that you see about the future and stuff in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. I personally believe that there's this theory out there, I, although I have never really done a deep study on JSTOR or anything, although I would like to, that those are dream, prophetic dream poetry. That those are prophetic dream poems th that were, you know, unlike what you see in the book of Daniel, where he's literally writing the dream out and then giving an interpretation, like something out of a dream journal. It seems that all those other major prophets, minor prophets, were writing out their dreams in song format or in poem format because it helped them to memorize it easier. Kind of like Homer did in, uh, in ancient Greece with the Iliad and the Odyssey. The bards, the, uh, the bardic tradition of, you know, uh, so I believe that that, but one thing, well, let's go back to Numbers 12, 6. When a prophet, word for word, mouth from the mouth of God here, when a prophet of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. There's another thing that's really important. I reveal myself to him in visions. In other words, they're not just dreams. Oftentimes, if not all the time, a true prophetic word is going to have God himself in the dream or the vision. You're going to see Jesus. <clears throat> you might not see his face, but he's going to be in the dream. Uh, or you're going to feel his presence, or you're going to feel, or you're going to hear the voice of the Father coming out of the dream, something like that, right? Now I'm not saying every single dream from the Holy Spirit has to have God Himself in it, but that would be definitely one that would to be take <clears throat> to be taken very seriously. Now, now let's check out Numbers 12:7. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. So in other words, Moses was so faithful to God and his word that he didn't have to receive revelation just in dreams and visions. You see? So people who have to get revelation, prophets who have to get revelation in dreams and visions are a little unfaithful to the Lord. Uh, they don't walk in perfect holiness and righteousness like Moses did. Now, I'm not saying Moses was a perfect man, but there's a difference being made here. It's the sanctification level that Moses was walking in versus just the regular ordinary prophet, right, determines, determines the level of revelation that you're going to get from the Lord. Moses doesn't have to just get dreams and visions. Moses gets to verse 8, Numbers 12:8. With him I speak face to face, clearly, and not in riddles. Riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Now, riddles, dreams, visions are riddles from the Holy Spirit. Uh... That's why there's this thing of interpretation being involved. They are riddles that have to be solved. Why? Because we are not faithful to the Lord. That's why. And so he's speaking to us, and it's grace that he speaks to us through dream riddles and vision riddles. But it's also a form of discipline, if not punishment, for our unfaithfulness and our moral 
laxity towards his word that he speaks to us in such mysterious ways. So the teaching is that the more holy you become to the word of God, the more clear and straightforward your dreams and visions will be. But if you're carnal and you're backsliding and you're lax towards the word of God, but you're still charismatic, the more the Lord might occasionally give you a dream and a vision, but it's going to have a riddling element to it because the Lord, the Lord gives clear visions and clear dreams to people who are really godly. But he gives unclear visions and unclear dreams to charismatics and believers that are have a lot of carnality in their lives. And he speaks to them in extreme riddles and extreme mysteries because he wants to see if they're going to spend time in the Word of God or go to Ira Milligan's understanding the dream you dream and try to interpret the message. And really, in other words, it's God's way of encouraging Bible study. He's saying, look, if I give you a riddling or a mysterious dream or vision, what are you going to have to do to figure it out? You're going to have to do Bible study to figure out the dream, right? That's why he does that. That's why he does that. That's why dreams are like that. So why did Jesus open his mouth in parables all the time? You know, the only time Jesus really spoke plainly in public was when he was either A, rebuking people for their impenitence and unbelief, or B, the Sermon on the Mount, where he explains the Ten Commandments. Every almost every other time Jesus is teaching stuff, it's parables. Why? Because he's trying to train not only the disciples, the 12 apostles, but he's also trying to train and acclimate all of his listeners to the idea of dream interpretation. And for those who are really, really hungry, they would, they would have gotten that. I mean, the teaching was there. The teaching was available back then. Uh, the idea of biblical symbolism and extracting meaning out of it, it was all there. And um, Matthew 23, 34, I am, Jesus said, I am sending you prophets. But here's, here's the downside of that. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. Well, if that's going on today, that means that Jesus is still in the business of sending Spirit-filled, charismatic dreamers and visionaries into churches to speak to Pharisaic pastors, because that is exactly what's going on in Matthew 23, 34. And they will be persecuted for delivering those prophetic words. I am sending you prophets. So... Now let's go to 1 Corinthians. Uh, now, now let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 17. This is a really another really important um, verse for what I'm talking about. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. I love this verse because it just cuts through all of that cessationism garbage that comes out of John MacArthur. I love the guy. I love the guy. I love his lordship salvation teaching. But I absolutely hate his anti-charismatic teaching. Absolutely hate that. Absolutely anathematize that. Now, I'm glad that John MacArthur exposes false prophets, people who are like Balaam and just after people's money. I'm, I'm happy for that. But I'm very, very, very much so anathematize his 100% anti-charismatic stuff. Don't agree with that at all. And I anathematize that teaching because the scripture says the opposite. Now, check out uh, Acts chapter 2. Now, most of the time when people are mention Acts chapter 2, they're only aware of Acts 2, 4. Because that's the Pentecostal Bible verse. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. That's really important. But go down to Acts 2, 17. I think a lot of people miss this one. 
in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Check that out. So it's not just about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's not just about speaking in tongues. It's about prophesying because you had visions and dreams. All right. So if you have faith for that, you can do that. If you have faith for that, you can do that. But guess what? It's not just visions and dreams and tongues. It's also signs. Check out uh, Acts 2.19. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. Signs on the earth below. What's a sign? It's a coincidence. Like like when um, a sign from God is like um, uh, like when, when Eliezer was trying to find a wife for Jacob. And he prays for her to show herself in the, in the watering of the camels in, in Genesis 24. And then by the time he's done praying, boom, there's Rebecca. She's from the family of Abraham. That's a sign on the earth below. right? So the baptism in the Holy Spirit enables people to speak in tongues during charismatic worship, enables people to prophesy because they have visions and dreams, and it enables them to walk in signs, uh, coincidences. But I would also say this healing miracles, and other types of miracles. What are miracles? Basically, miracles are things that happen in answer to spirit-filled prayer. So you're led by the Spirit to pray for a certain miraculous thing to happen, and then it does happen. It actually does happen. And of course, that's a crazy thought to have. If anybody prays for a miracle, they're crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, Peter, come out on the water with me. That's a crazy thought. But the Holy Spirit, uh, if you have the Holy Spirit inspiring it, do it. You know, That's how the miracles will start to happen. So you get baptism in the Holy Spirit, a.k.a. charismatic worship. You feel the Holy Spirit. And this opens you up to tongues, visions and dreams, prophecies, signs and wonders. Sounds like a good deal to me. So if you take Acts chapter 2, 4, all the way up through Acts 2, 19, you have the whole panoply. And you also have get drunk in the Spirit sometimes when you do charismatic worship. Acts 2, 13. However, some made fun of them, saying they have had too much wine. Well, Why did they say that? Because they look like a bunch of drunk people. So uh, the Toronto blessing, as much as as imperfect as it was, I mean, it's all right here, man. So uh, now here, here you have it. Act, uh, Matthew 23, 34, I am sending you prophets. Jesus said that. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. I have this this chapter so highlighted and so marked up. I've been over it so many times. Somebody called this, I, I don't know who called it, 1 Corinthians 14, the charismatic manual. The charismatic manual. And I think probably the best, I have never really read it yet, but probably the the best teaching book on this is uh, Don Basham's book, Handbook on Tongues Interpretation and Prophecy. But uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, it starts off by saying, hey, you Christians. 1 Corinthians 14, 1, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. We're talking about miraculous gifts. 100% supernatural spiritual experiences here. And, you know, if we understand prophecy in the context, it's visions and dreams type stuff. Um, and then he goes on talking about speaking in tongues and feeling the Holy Spirit, uh, which is baptism in the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues, somebody's a God type stuff. Okay, and now uh, words of knowledge are starting to come in to the picture. And then... We're talking about praying in tongues in verse 14, singing in tongues in verse 15, and praising God in tongues in verse 16. All of this is charismatic worship. 
1 uh, Corinthians 14, 18, Paul says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. So Apostle Paul, if he was alive today, he could relate he could relate to an assembly as a God preacher who you know where they really emphasize speaking in tongues there. Uh, now then of course words of knowledge are encouraged. First Corinthians fourteen twenty five, the secrets of his heart will be laid bare, so he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. Okay. Uh 1 Corinthians 14, 26. What then shall we say, brothers? Here's the foundation, the scriptural support for having prophets in the church today in a Sunday service actually sharing prophecies. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. What then shall we say, brothers? When you come together, everyone has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation. That's a prophetic word. That's a word of knowledge. A tongue or an interpretation. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. And here's the caveat. Here's the limitation on that. 1 Corinthians 14, 29. Two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully what is said. In other words, judge those prophecies. You can only do two or three a Sunday service. So if a fourth and a fifth one comes in, sorry, share it next Sunday. First uh, Corinthians uh, 14:31, you can all prophesy in turn. You can take your turns. Okay. So there you have it, man. 1 Corinthians 14, 37, listen to this. If anybody thinks he is a prophet or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. It is assumed. And he ends this chapter one more time. 1 Corinthians 14, 39, Therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy, and do not forbid speaking in tongues. But everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Okay, Only two or three prophecies should be speak, shared with the pastor during the Sunday service. You should take turns. You should be patient. You should get in line, and you should do it in an uh, orderly way. What are the means of prophecy? It's visions and dreams. It's the visions and dreams. Now, some people say that there are nabby prophecies. I um I don't know very much about that. I think Bill Heyman's books might go into this more. Um, but Nabi is a Hebrew word, N-A-B-I, and that means I think it means bubbling up. Um, uh, and I don't know very much about this gift, but I've seen some people moving it before, and I know it's a real gift. I've I've seen people give words of knowledge to me before and I know it's a real gift. Uh, this is where people have their eyes open and they they speak kind of in a um, in a frenetic manner kind of um, kind of in a rushed uh, their words will kind of rush out of them and they'll kind of be passionate and words of knowledge will come out of them. Um, I've seen this once or twice before so I know it's a real gift. I just um, I just don't know very much about that. Well, that's that's all I have to say. Are there prophets around today? Absolutely. I've I've experienced words of knowledge from Pentecostal people about uh, six or seven times in the course of my life. I've been a Christian for 25 years. I know it's real. Um, I have. And 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna say this. I've experienced extreme accurate prophetic uh, readings of my secrets of my heart, according to 1 Corinthians 14, 25, uh, from three uh, uh, African-American uh, Pentecostal people. So this gift is very highly developed in the Pentecostal, in the African-American uh, Pentecostal churches. But I've also experienced it once or twice from 
uh, white Pentecostal people as well, um, kind of from a southern background, uh, Church of God type background. So it's there as well. But um, um, our prophets around today, yes, absolutely. They're going to have a Pentecostal background, and they love and revere the Word of God. They believe in personal holiness, personal sanctification, um, and they can read the secrets of your hearts, man. Now, are there false prophets out there, like these people on TV? Yeah. But uh, the fact that there's a counterfeit out there does not does not cancel out the fact that there's an authentic out there. You know, where do the counterfeit people get the idea to counterfeit it from? Where do they come up with the idea of a fake word of knowledge? Well, they got it from the I got the idea from somebody who had a real word of knowledge. and They thought of counterfeiting it and making a buck on it, you know. So where did they get the idea to fake it in the first place? Well, they probably heard about something real happening, you know. And then they backslid from the Lord and, you know, try to manipulate the body of Christ. So just because there's a counterfeit word of knowledge out there doesn't mean that there's not the real thing. God bless you out there. This is John with WesleyGospel.com.